Our first panel today is on the, society, the science policy society interface and the role of open science in strengthening this interface. We're looking forward to hearing from an eminent panel of speakers on how this interface is shifting during COVID-19, new opportunities being created, new challenges, and how to move forward toward climate action. The panel will be moderated by Ms. Ying Chian Chen, correspondent with the New York Bureau of Hong Kong Phoenix Satellite Television. Ying Chian Chen has served as the on-camera United Nations correspondent at Phoenix Satellite Television since 2016, covering international affairs and foreign relations. She has interviewed UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez and many other leaders at the UN. Ms. Chen was the first Chinese journalist to host the one-week SDG high-level interviews during the uh, 2014, during the 74th UN General Assembly. She also hosted a TV program for former US President Al Gore's show, 24 Hours of Reality. Ms. Chen's exclusive interview with the 74th President of the UN General Assembly, His Excellence Tijiani Muhammad Bande, won the Best Reporting Award in 2019. Ying Chian, it is a pleasure to have you here today. The floor is yours to introduce the panelists for this session and lead the discussion. Over to you. Thank you, Estra, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's panel, and I am Ying Chen. I am a United Nations correspondent from Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Um, so in this session, we will be talking about open science, which means the open access to research and knowledge that advance collaboration in the science community. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, the open science has been accelerated. But in the meantime, we know some new challenges emerged like misinformation, distrust in science. Um, so in today's panel, we will have four experienced and leading guest speakers talking about the recent trends, the lessons we have learned from the pandemic, and why we need a strong science policy society interface to combat some future crises like the climate change, and thus to achieve the SDGs. So for the next 40 minutes, we will have our speakers introduce their findings one by one, and then we will have a 20 minutes Q&A session so for our audience, if you want to ask the panelists a question, just feel free uh, to type in in the Q&A sidebar and remember to name the panelists that you want to ask. And for our panelists, please um, remember to limit each of your remarks within 10 minutes. So first, um, let me introduce you. Our first panelist, Mr. Fernanda Beigel the researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council of Argentina, and she is the chair of the UNESCO Open Science Committee. Um, her most recent publications focuses on multi-scale perspective for accessing the publishing circuits in non-hegemonic countries like Latin America. She is also the writer of UNESCO's report on the time for open sciences now. So Fernanda, the floor is yours. Please take your time. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and I thank UNESCO, the United Nations and Ariel, Astra, Thanos and all the staff for all the help in, in making this conference really a very smooth thing for all of us. And I would like to start saying that the importance of open science within the global health crisis we are facing all today comes from the fact that COVID-19 proved war worldwide the urgency of boosting scientific progress as a human right and the need to enhance scientific collaboration in order to respond to global emergencies, increasing the resilience of societies. If we go to the next slide, we will see that uh, I am quoting some of um, our dear Shamila Nair Bedwell's ideas. What are the lessons that we can learn from this pandemic? For example, the importance of a timely and free access to scientific data, publications, information, the relevance of scientific collaborations, sharing of information at all levels, the need of science policy so society dialogue, and finally, open science as a keystone to broaden the human right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress. In that way, we can increase as I was saying, the resiliency of societies. Now, if we go to the next uh, slide, I would like to say that we can, uh, in the work we've been uh, doing for 
for the draft of the UNESCO recommendation with all the colleagues in the scientific committee, we can say that we have the five key pil pillars of open science. These are the open, the, 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 the of openness, I am trying to say. Right, so the, the openness regarding the dialogue with other knowledge systems, mutual knowledge and recognition of complementarities between diverse epistemologies, including indigenous knowledge systems, of course. The openness of the research assessment system to open science. It's very important to change the incentives and reward open science in the evaluation of careers, projects, publications, the open evaluation also to build participatory science and to promote trust in science. The other pillar is the open access to scientific knowledge. We all, this is one of the, the areas that is most known by, by everyone worldwide. It means scientific publications, research that the software source code and hardware available in the public domain or under copyright that has been released under open license. In the fourth place, open science infrastructures. I'm going to go, come back to this in, in a minute after when we pass to the lessons in Latin America. But we need a set of instruments, databases and digital infrastructures that are needed to support open science. And the main thing there is to gain and to uh, achieve interoperability, right? And finally, another pillar, the open engagement of societal actors, the multiple and extended collaboration between scientists and social, societal actors to make scientific progress more inclu inclusive and to make it more accessible to broaden uh, the, in the inquiring society. And so if we go to the next slide, we can ask ourselves, however, to adhere to these goals that I was mentioning and to these key pillars of open science and, and to define open science and to, to move towards a global consensus, consensus on open science, it's not really enough. I mean, the main challenge for the transition to open science is to surpass the diverse inequalities that affect the universal access to the benefits of science. And how to surpass the asymmetries existing because of the digital so one of the asymmetries that is related to this uh, digital divide has to do with infrastructure and the infrastructure that is needed for opening data and to make citizen science truly possible. This is why I, I chose to, to talk with you about the Latin American road to open science and the less lessons we can learn from this experience. How can we advance towards open science in a region that evidently is not um, a hegemonic region in which we can find the, um, the technological dispositions that we can find in other places. But how can we boost the, the conditions, the, the, the endogenous uh, conditions that we do have for open science? First of all, this region has a very old national information systems developed since the 1950s. We have national scientific agencies, national documentation centers, libraries at the biggest public universities that are very professionalized with very professionalized librarians. And we have indexed systems for journals since the 1970s. This classe and periodica. On the second place, we have open access national laws in some countries like Peru since 2013, Argentina, Mexico, Uruguay. And we also have in progress two national CRIS projects, which are, uh, for those who don't know this um, acronym, it's the current research information systems. These type of systems that can really put and integrate different information from persons, from projects and from um, institutions. We have two pr projects ongoing in Peru and in Brazil. We also have in Latin America regional networks and publishing databases. For example, very important and big regional um, digital libraries that started, that started in the 1960s related to health and in the case of BDM, or to social sciences and humanities in the case of Claxo. Also, the repositories and indexes systems that uh, were professionalized since the 1990s, like Latindex, Cielo, Revalic, and Biblat, which reunites Classe and Periodica. We also have a regional repository 
Federation, which includes 10 countries. It harvests 790 institutions and journals, and we have more than 3 million document, documents, almost 2 million articles, and uh, really a, a massive uh, background of doctoral and master dissertations. And I would like to mention that Latin America has also a very, very long existing regional tradition of university extension, what in English and maybe in the in north would be called the third mission in the universities. And this can boost citizen and participatory science. This can benefit from the long existing interactions that are developed in third mission. So one of the things that we are discussing in Latin America in this moment is the need to add an extension component to these new current research information systems. If we now go to the final slide, I would just like uh, to, to end this uh, presentation saying that these re uh, national police systems that are starting to appear in Brazil, in Peru, are uh, a traditional, are, are based on, on a traditional path that our region offers for these type of systems. And this, this could be critical for the rest of the um, tasks that we have in the transitions to open science. In Latin America, science is indeed mainly managed as a public good. Open access has been developed since 1990 by the academic, uh, academic community as a common good in all these uh, um, uh, experiences that I mentioned before since the 1950s and 60s. We have regional portals, we have academic journals and publishing databases that are sustained by scientific agencies and by the big public universities. These current research information systems that are uh, ongoing as national projects, such as the examples of Peru and Brazil, show a path to interoperable infrastructures that are really critical for the next steps that we have to make. We do have a, a very important um, task in Latin America regarding the alignment of regional assessment systems to open science and to add a component for university extension. And we have a very important resource in the regional, in, in our region, which is La Referencia. This federation that I mentioned before has developed the infrastructure and the technology required to create an exploratory project for a regional CRIS system that we are discussing uh, as, uh, in, in the last uh, few months in Latin America. We have relevant regional actors that could help in this process, like the Regional Conference of Higher Education, all the national agencies that we call on seats in Spanish, the UNESCO Regional Office, the uh, Organization of Ibero-American States, and we also have the Latin American Forum on Research Assessment, in which I uh, participate actively, and where we are trying to discuss all these regional projects. So I hope we can learn from some of these lessons that are really making efforts from the south, the global south, in order to create um, a, a public uh, domain for open science in Latin America. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you. Um, thank you, Fernanda, for sharing with us your findings and insights, especially giving us the original perspective and some concrete examples in Latin America. So now I will invite our guest, Carrie Funk. Um, she is the Director of Science and Society Research at Pew Research Center, where, where she leads the center's efforts to understand the implications of science for society. She has also very broad expertise in public opinion research and has specialized in public understanding of science topics for nearly two decades. So Carrie, are you there? I am here. So yes, yeah. my apologies to everyone. Thank you to all the folks behind the scenes who um, are making this happen. And um, I appreciate your patience. Um, you know, what I want to talk about is the science policy society interface. And I guess I'm I'm really focused on the society piece of what what the public thinks about science. Um, so that's what I'm going to share some data with you to help ground that conversation. Uh, many people think about this interface as really dependent on public trust. Um, and I think I just would, would emphasize that it's trust in scientists, it's trust in the, in the product science produces, 
um, the most uh, pressing right now being vaccines, but it's also the organizations and companies that produce these products. It's government and how the government is, is integrating scientific advice. So let's go to the first slide, which I hope will tee up some of our conversation here. It's a snapshot of Pew Research Center surveys done around the world. There were 17 publics in this survey. We, we couldn't quite fit all of the data in here. Um, but one of the things that has stood out uh, during the coronavirus pandemic is how different governments were approaching uh, ways to slow the spread of the disease. Um, and this is a rating of what people think of how their government has done handling the outbreak. And the big takeaway uh, in this spring is that many places have given their governments more negative ratings uh, in handling it. You see a big drop there in Germany. You also see a rise in negative views in Japan, but it's a common pattern across many places. One exception there is the UK. Um, so that I think one of the takeaways from that is to remember that uh, this is actually quite correlated with case counts and the and the rise and falls of um, additional kind of uh, spreads of the of the disease, um, and that probably tells us that outcomes matter um, quite a bit. Um, you can go ahead and move forward. You know the other thing that's true in people's ratings of government handling of the outbreak is that they tend to be closely connected with their support for um, the governing coalition in that country, or you could just say more broadly in people's political leanings. Um, so this is another way to capture that. This is um, uh, showing that ideological differences tend to also line up with people's assessments of whether there should have been more restrictions or fewer restrictions. And what you're seeing here is the share who say there should have been fewer restrictions on public activity over the past year or so. Um, and that tends to be more strongly held among those on the right, um, less so on those on the left. Um, and of course, there are very big differences in the US where uh, political differences have really come to dominate how Americans see the pandemic um, and pretty much every aspect of its handling. But it's also true in many other places, um, in many places in Western Europe and in Australia and Canada and a few others, um, you see a similar pattern. So go ahead and shift to the next slide. We're gonna move to US data here, but I think it's US data that speaks to a global story. Um, and one thing to notice here is the, the ups and downs in people's intention to get a coronavirus vaccine. Um, pretty dramatic ups and downs, you know, from the time it was just a hypothetical idea. There was a lot of interest and then it went down as people heard more about the about the process and then it went back up as of February uh, when the first vaccines were available in the US. The other part of this slide on the right hand is to remind you that we see a lot of unevenness among people in society, that there are kind of, there've been kind of consistent differences in who's more inclined and who's more disinclined to get the vaccine. And I'm gonna just pull out one. Um, which is to, to point out that younger adults um, have been less inclined to get to get a coronavirus vaccine um, with connected with the sense that they're less at risk for a serious case of the disease. And by contrast, older adults have lined up rather quickly to get the jab. Um, and global polls have told a similar story about that. This is, you know, we're seeing these kinds of patterns across societies around the world. Um, and, and go ahead and move forward. You know, beyond demographics, um, you also have seen an up and down in people's intent to get a coronavirus vaccine that's connected with their sense of trust in the vaccines here, trust in the research and development process to produce a safe and effective vaccine. Um, so we, and then what you're seeing here is people's individual level of trust or confidence in the vaccine R&D process, very closely connected with their interest or intention to get a vaccine. It's a smaller share of Americans who have kind of low levels of trust in that process, but they're very strongly, 77% of that group, strongly disinclined to get a coronavirus vaccine. The difference between the most trusting and the least trusting is 75 percentage points, which is a pretty large um, finding in these kinds of data. Um, go ahead and move forward. Um, uh, you know, of course, one of the questions on all of our minds has been, whether or not the pandemic and the spotlight on scientists during this period has would help boost public trust in science. 
Um, this is again US data. The, the short answer is that trust um, since the pandemic has had has seen a short uh, kind of a small uptick over time, um, but that uptick has been uneven, which is what you're going to see here. So we're focused on the kind of darker blue, which is the strongest level of trust or confidence in scientists to act in the public interests. Um, and on the right hand side among Democrats that has gone up since the time of the pandemic. In fact, it's been rising over time. But on the left hand side among Republicans, um, we see that trust has has been kind of flat and even has gone down in the most recent survey. So as a result of that, what we're seeing is the difference between Democrats and Republicans over trust in scientists is now the widest that we've seen since 2016. Now, I think of this data as our kind of general or overarching measure of trust in scientists. We'll go ahead and move to the next slide. We, of course, have done a lot of things to try to unpack how people think about scientists. And trust is often uh, talked about as being multifaceted. So, you know, people's trust in the incompetence of scientists to do their jobs can be quite different than their trust in empathy or their trust even in the accuracy of information that scientists give. Um, now here I'm just pulling out a comparison of people's ratings of medical doctors with that of medical research scientists and each row is a separate question. Um, one of the things that you would notice here is that more Americans uh, trust the caring and concern of medical doctors relative to medical research scientists. They see more, um, more caring and concern there. They say they do it all or most of the time. Um, that's, that actually ties with the idea of trust as being an expectation for the future. So that's why the rating is that way. Say, uh, you know, kind of, can you, it's essentially saying, can you count on scientists to act in this way? How often um, can you count on them to do so? Now, what really struck us is in the bottom three rows. Um, and that, uh, that I, I would characterize as a shared skepticism. Uh, for both medical doctors and medical research scientists about issues of ethics and integrity. Um, and we, we did these kinds of ratings for scientists in environmental, uh, working in environmental areas, as well as in nutrition science. And we saw a very similar pattern across all six groups. Um, so what you're seeing there, I, I would take as Americans being fairly cautious and suspicious around these kinds of issues. 15% of Americans saying that uh, medical doctors would be transparent about potential conflicts of interest with industry all or most of the time. Same share saying that about medical researchers. A uh, similar share saying that that uh, scientists would admit their own mistakes and take responsibility for them all or most of the time. Um, and the bottom row, if there was a case of uh, misconduct researcher or professional misconduct, um, generally Americans saying that those scientists would face serious consequences for misconduct, um, a small share saying that would happen all or most of the time. So that, um, that I think is useful to keep in mind. I think the next slide will also show us that there are also some hints in this survey about ways to build trust. Um, we asked people what would make a difference to them, would it make them more or less trusting in research? Uh, and um, I think the answers here are very clear. 57% of Americans uh, said that if, if scientific research findings uh, came from data that's openly available to the public, that would make them more trusting in those findings. Uh, you see also that about half of Americans said that if the research is independently reviewed or by a third party review, that would make, uh, make them have more trust in those research findings. So I think this data shows that people see some of these open science practices as signals of trustworthiness. Um, you know, I would keep in mind as well that many in the US see science and scientists in a positive light overall, or sometimes in a softly positive light. Global polls tell us a similar story. Um, but at the same time, people often look with caution around these issues of transparency and accountability and open research practices could be one way to help address that skepticism. You know, one thing many people think about trust is that it's really earned, it's rooted in experience. It's not static over time, you have to keep reinforcing it. Um, and, uh, but ultimately that 
trust and uh, trust in any group is really about that sense of expectation for the future and how can you help build that sense between the public and scientists. So with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you for sharing with us your uh, interesting findings during the pandemic and how the citizens in different countries respond to government's uh, policies regarding to restriction measures, getting vaccines in, et cetera, and how trust and the science policy society can interface. So Natalia, let me just introduce you a little bit. And Natalia Carsey, she is the Open Data Charter's uh, interim executive director. She worked it <clears throat> as the open government director for the Undersecretary of Public Innovation and Open Government of Argentina, where she coordinated the co-creation for the third Open Government National Action Plan. She was also um, the Open Government Coordinator for the Digital Division of the Government of Chile and for the City of Buenos Aires. So Natalia, can we have your speak right now? Please take the floor. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for the invitation. Thanks for all the technical help to get here. Um, let me go through the process of sharing my screen. <laughs> So, um, as I said, I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Open Data Charter. We are a collaboration between over 150 governments and, and experts working on open data uh, all around the world. The Open Data Charter was launched in 2015. Uh, first, as a document, we, we held a, a global discussion around principles of open data. Um, we had in-person webinars, uh, service in three languages, um, and, and discussions uh, in, in various various areas. And uh, the, globally, we decided that these were the six principles uh, that any government in, in any level of government could actually uptake to promote uh, open data as a policy. So you can see here the six, the six principles, uh, open by default, timely and comprehensive publication of data, uh, data that is accessible and, and usable, that, that is comparable and interoperable, um, for improved government and citizen, citizen engagement. So uh, informed participation also as one of the key areas of, of uh, any, any open data policy. And for inclusive development and, and innovation, we've seen open data as part of, of, the, of the SDGs um, transparencies initiatives uh, over, the, over the, first, the past years. So um, aside from the document, there was the, the decision to create the institution to help out with to help out with uh, to help out with with the, the implementation of this. Uh, and so uh, the Open Data Charter as an institution was created. Um, I'm not sure you are able to see my screen right now, uh, but we are in the uh, discussion of, of the data impact framework. Uh, the, the way that we work is we understand that there is different steps within the kind of life of data. So the first step would be data production uh, of, of the, um, data production. Um, we work mainly um, around that, that, uh, that area uh, to understand how uh, openness can be embedded within this first step, just thinking about how data will be open uh, in the moment that we create the data. Then, of course, a second step of, of data sharing, um, how that, sha how that uh, sharing happens, which platforms, which licenses uh, are, are um, accompanying that, that phase of open, opening up the data. Um, data processing, and, and that's where the data use uh, bit starts. So uh, understanding that promoting the reuse of, of data, it's part of an open data policy. So, who is using the data, um, making, making the connections with the potential reusers, journalists, scientists, uh, CSOs. Uh, so there's a whole, uh, a whole world of possible reuse of, of that data. Uh, then, of course, we, we also promote action, like take, uh, this, take decisions, make the data-driven decisions, uh, data-driven uh, publications, data-driven uh, research. And then, of course, there's always has to be a response mechanism to this whole process. So um, data reusers need to be able to to uh, to uh, request the another uh, certain types of data uh, in order to request data quality uh, need to be heard 
throughout this whole process, but there needs to be a response mechanism so that we can improve data production and once again, uh, go through the data sharing and data processing and the action taken uh, using data. Uh, what has happened throughout the years of, of kind of open data policies is um, when we first saw governments uh, uh, coming into the open data world, they were all creating open data portals and just publishing whatever they could. Um, so it was uh, a, a policy of publish and they will come. So we will have the open data portal and, and everybody will come and use our data. Um, but over the years, uh, within the Open Data Charter, we're starting promoting the publish with a purpose idea. So first, let's try to think which is the public, uh, the public problem, the, the, the civic problem that we're trying to tackle uh, while developing the, the Open Data Policy and then start, um, start the process of, of publication. So getting uh, everybody involved in the decision of the problem and then opening up the data. We know that that uh, I've been a public official in my past life and I know that uh, opening up data, it's not it's not as simple as just push a button and that's it. Uh, so prioritization, uh, a collaborative prioritization of which uh, data sets should be open first, uh, it's needed and, and the purpose of that of that uh, open data portal uh, being open data means to another end, not an end in itself. Um, so working working within that frame of publish with a purpose and moving to the next uh, to the next slide. <laughs> um, the the idea is how does open data uh, um, play out in the open science world? So open data is seen as a strategic asset for research projects. Uh, freely accessible data can help foster new investigations or improve already ongoing investigations, overall research and collaborations and cross-examination. Um, but then we have open science data, which is specifically talking about the publication of observations and results of, of research in open formats for analysis and reuse so that um, the, the scientific world can also um, come into this open data and it's already uh, it's already happening, but um, can open up the data of their research uh, in order to improve their own research or to just foster new investigations and, and cross examination um, and just adding the, the public value that open data itself brings. Uh, and I think COVID-19, we think the open data charter and mostly in the open data community, I think COVID-19 showed a good example of how openness in the open scientific data uh, sprung collaboration to tackle uh, a very much important public problem that we were all having and, and collaboration is the has been and is the way to to uh, tackle COVID. So uh, we had kind of a real life, uh, real time example of how that was playing out, even even just sharing links of, of uh, research papers on, on Twitter. So it was a massive uh, kind of showcase of what uh, collaboration could look like. Uh, in, in the scientific world to tackle a specific, in this case, global problem. But what, what has the Open Data Charter done so far uh, as, as, uh, as climate change, which is one of the core issues of, of the conference? So with this published with a purpose idea, we have created practical tools to help uh, governments uh, kind of collect and, and manage and release sectorial data. So. Uh, understanding that there, there are public policies that, that most governments developed around these four areas uh, that we have worked with. We've always partnered with a, with a thematic expert within any of these, of these uh, thematic areas. We bring in the open data knowledge, they bring in the thematic, uh, the thematic expertise and we create these practical tools that are now called the open up guides. Uh, as you can see there, we've tackled agriculture, climate action, anti-corruption and land governance. Um, but I will, I will do a double click on the climate action work that we've done uh, so far on understanding which, which are the high value data sets of a, of a climate action agenda uh, and, and also understanding that, um, for example, all the Paris Agreement uh, signatories have reporting obligations. Um, Article 13 of the Paris Agreement actually talks about transparency and, uh, and now we have an enhanced Article 13 of, of the Paris Agreement uh, that actually talks about innovations in how governments are transparent about, about the reporting mechanisms. So we've seen a lot of um, public value that has been locked within these reporting mechanisms. And so the idea was to create these, these open up guides specifically on climate change to 
uh, help promote the openness of, of the specific data that governments are creating in order uh, to report. Uh, but but that data has multiple possible uh, and, and inimaginable uh, uses that has been kind of locked just because the governments report with that data and that's it, they don't publish it. So we've been trying to figure out how to uh, open up that data and we worked uh, with the with the World Resources Institute to create that open up guide and we implemented the guide in, in Uruguay. So I wanted to bring a little bit um, the, the news about what went on. So uh, the, the open up guide has 30, 72 data sets uh, that, that are actually promoted as high value data sets. Uh, also always under the umbrella of, of the Paris Agreement. So when we first started, only 20 of those, of those 72 data sets had some degrees of openness in, in Uruguay. We worked as we did with the creation of the tool uh, with the environmental ministry and AGESIC, which is the digital, uh, the digital, um, the the kind of the modernization and digital uh, directory within the the Uruguayan government. So as we did, like us working on open data and the World Resources Institute working on climate change, we we collaborated with the two offices that kind of mirrored our expertise and they collaborated among themselves, of course. Of course, um, and so we identified. Uh, from the overall climate agenda, which were the priorities uh, for Uruguay, and uh, and so which was waste and, and climate finance, and we created a strategy with them and with with civil society organizations and academia um, to uh, to co-create this strategy for opening up the, that high high value data sets. Since the work that we've done, uh, 20 new data sets have been opened. We have been able to improve the data skills within the public sector, and, and they have already started to create ways of, of making that data more uh, relatable to citizens. So they've created new visualizations uh, around greenhouse emissions uh, that are, are very much engaging and, and uh, explainable for um, more easy to understand for, for everyday citizens, for people that is not working with the climate change world. Uh, some of the core learnings of working of working in Uruguay for uh, open data on climate change, um, there is indeed public value locked uh, in data that government governments create for international reporting mechanisms. So governments that just create that data and they report back to, in this case, UN offices, um, there's, there's, there's added value there that needs to be unlocked uh, through through the openness of that data, it is actually public data. So um, the the working within within that framework actually helps us see this. Uh, the guide uh, was a, was a really good tool to kind of engage and manage ex expectations in the collaboration process, in the participation process, and it actually helped kind of have a, a really good conversations and create bridges between civil society uh, organizations and governments because we were all working within this framework of the 72, uh, 72 high value data sets. And then also we, we worked on, on understanding the priorities, the national priorities there. Um, then we, we started this maybe, um, we started this phrase of interoperability of, of people. It's important as interoperability of data. So to create this collaborative environments, uh, collaborative uh, prioritization of data sets uh, and, and having those uh, conversations that might not be easy, but to understand the priorities and the agendas that everybody brings into that collaboration uh, round round tables or workshops or whatever you do, it's important. So connecting the people is as important as connecting the data uh, to, to spring these open data policies. Um, and then what we found is uh, specifically on, on climate change, um, Data is super technical, so people within the climate change uh, community really understand when you talk about uh, BUR or there's a lot of, of uh, technical data there. So we need uh, to make this collaboration even even move, move a little bit deeper uh, in order for for the connection between the climate change con the climate change community and the, in this example the open data community to talk and kind of translate what the data actually means. Um, because just getting the data out there, it's not it's not enough. Uh, there's a lot of techn technicity that needs to be kind of translated uh, in order for that data to be uh, actually uh, being able to, to reuse that data. Uh, and I think I'm going to leave it out there and thank you once again for the invitation.
Thank you so much, Natalia. Thank you uh, for sharing the data impact framework. As you mentioned, publish with purpose can make data delivery more effective and can also help to solve specific policy problems. So now I want to introduce our last speaker for this panel, Mr. Martin Winstein. Oh, Winstein, sorry. He is um, Martin Winstein as the founder of the executive director of the Open Earth Foundation. And he is also, uh, this foundation is a research and deployment uh, nonprofit focusing on digital innovations and open collaborations around, uh, plan around planetary scale projects, such as developing a global climate accounting system, open climate. Um, Martin is also resident fellow at the Yale City, uh, the Yale Center for Business and Environment. Well, he leads the research efforts behind the Yale Open Innovation Lab. So Martin, the floor is yours. Please take your time. Thank you very much, Yinyin, um, Astra, and uh, everyone for joining today. Thank you very much, the UN. I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to participate in the panel and a fascinating uh, connection to join with two other uh, fellow Argentinians today. Um, I would uh, I would like to primarily address without slides today, and I think it'll it'll make maybe the process easier. But I'll talk first about uh, the the intersection of how COVID affected the 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 climate climate action and the climate sentiment, but particularly last year, how how we lived this, and and then move on to what are some of the most interesting uh, opportunities and promising developments. In, in our ability to address the climate challenge. Most of our work has been in the intersection of digital innovation and climate. So uh, beyond open science, how that trickles into open source technology. The first reaction that uh, COVID uh, produced, particularly uh, for some in the, in the climate world, around March last year, where climate was the most important thing in mainstream agenda, as we would see, uh, Australia being literally on fire and and uh, different places of the world creating a lot of sentiment around it that that it it took away attention from the front lines of climate into uh, putting more bandwidth from from people in the in the COVID um, um, agenda but that obviously it's a natural process that we will have to constantly manage with uh, competing attention for global challenges the second is actually how it has helped in the sense, because in many ways, COVID helped, has helped expose that we are deeply globalized. Um, something happening in one part of the world trickles into the rest of the globe, but yet not properly orchestrated on how we tackle the impact and challenges that trickle in that global infrastructure. Uh, how do we What's the speed and the level of uh, coordination in facing uh, global emergencies? And that's been our, our primary challenge in the climate space all throughout, our ability to act as a single uh, entity. So showcasing perhaps some of, some of the gaps and the opportunities, I think has actually been uh, quite important. Uh, but more than anything, they both share something uh, deeply connected in the ability of, of coordination there, which is, it helps us realize that we are all part of the same system. And that is a is a very important piece that, that I'd like to touch base upon um, soon around our ability to collaborate is, is, is the degrees of consciousness that we have, no matter uh, whether it's through the individual level, the collective um, public sphere, uh, that we are actually we all share the same system, in this case, planet Earth. I, I was hoping that not having slides would help, but somehow my Microsoft Teams just crashed as I was speaking. Um, uh, sorry to add again with a series of, of bumps today, uh, but that actually leads to my third point of, of the effect that COVID had in, 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 our, in, uh, in, in climate, but also our society, which is has taken us entirely online. So we really depend on the fabric of, uh, of our technology to communicate uh, across boundaries in an online setting. Um, and that in many ways circles back to some of the primary tensions that you were introducing again at the beginning. Um, and so when we, when we talk about uh, some of the opportunities going forward, we have to realize that in the case of open science, um, 
and open data and information, there's a huge uh, power for collaboration and openness, but it, it has also produced in the context of COVID uh, uh, an, a new rise of misinformation, right? And then an attention for people to start distrusting that because they don't necessarily know um, where to follow. And we've we've seen uh, fascinating uh, experiences where people get their COVID facts through WhatsApp without necessarily knowing where the information is coming from. So when we, when we look at some of the most important opportunities in the intersection of digital technology and innovation and the climate space, um, I could probably break it down to four key points. The first one is rebuilding digital trust. And that is definitely not a trivial fact uh, uh, because it um, requires that we rethink how the internet is governed and the role that identities, digital identities have in the internet. But some of the most promising developments that we've seen on this front actually come from the realm of cryptography. In, in, the, in the rise of distributed ledger technologies, uh, particularly at, at, at around 2017, with the rise of networks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, but more than anything, the underlying blockchain technology, which is designed for decentralized consensus, there, there, is, there is a rise for new cryptographic tools to ensure digital trusted interactions in the internet. And the amount of research in this space, particularly in the last four years, has exploded in a very positive way. And so that level of new technological and cryptographic practices seeping into uh, the ability of, of helping uh, trace trusted interactions on the internet becomes extremely important. And not, not uh, to leave aside how that can counteract the role that artificial intelligence can have, because it blurs the boundary of who's a human and who's, and who's a computer in, in, in the online internet world. So uh, digital trust is also based on, on trusting peer-to-peer -peer dynamics, and the basis of scientific method is on the trust of, of our peers and, our, and, our, and, the, and the power and, and this has been a core topic both at the Yale Open Lab and the Open Earth Foundation. How, how do we see collaboration as the ultimate technology that we are yet to master? Because I can, I can talk a lot about the role of uh, more grounded digital to tech, but in many ways, the, the capacity for us to, again, orchestrate as, uh, as, a, as a single system sort of, uh, uh, to address existential issues is, I think still a technology that 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 uh, that we're yet to to develop. The first part that we see promising developments on this is the ability to create new incentive designs. Again, also uh, through the hand that digital technology can help if we're creating a common uh, solution, whether it's open source technology, whether it's an open data repository. By creating incentive designs, we can track who is contributing to that the value of those contributions and, uh, and being able to create scalable models where we can see that the total is more than the sum of the parts. And that is a fundamental driver for, for incentive. I will, I will contribute to a common system because the total coming out of it uh, actually produces a lot more benefit. Now that could be uh, purely reputational and, rep and the track, being able to track reputation is a, is a function of, of trust but also even um, monetary if needed. So it, we, we talked about before in the tension of, of profit or nonprofit, open doesn't necessarily go against nonprofit. Uh, nonprofit. There are, there's been an evolution over the last 10 years of the ability of um, proprietary uh, applications and technology operating on top of um, totally open digital infrastructure. In fact, that divide becomes more and more important. Role of proprietary data sets, being able to nurture an environment of open data sets. Um, so in the process, as, as we think about new incentive designs where tokenomics and community tokens, because in many ways, these are s sort of uh, the ability of creating trusted consortium and contribution to a common uh, part becomes particularly important and promising over the next years. However, one of the most thing, important things around scaling collaboration is our ability uh, to go from competition 
through collaboration. And that requires breaking our illusion of separation. In other ways, how do we transcend our egos to be able to work together, realizing that we share a common system? And going back to what I said at the beginning, COVID and particularly the climate impact is uh, only going to hopefully help on that. Um, because no matter where we are, we are still part of the same um, uh, common global system. The third point around interesting opportunities is bringing that digital trust and our ability to scale collaboration into the exponential action that we need. And, 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 and the fundamental part of that is the absolute democratization for, in this case, climate action. Whether it's not expecting a government to do all the job or the private sector, but realizing the exponential um, actions come from uh, everyone taking a, a role in that. And that has also been something that COVID uh, helped us express. Everyone has a role to play. In the climate space, that can take two, two clear illustrative formats. One is the role that we individually uh, in our climate footprint, our, our, uh, our personal impact is actually nested within, let's say an organization that I operate, which is geographically nested in a subnational government nested into the national government and nested into the international arena. Uh, looking at the Paris Agreement, that becomes very important because the Paris Agreement primarily relates between sovereign nations, the parties to, to, to the UNFCCC and the UNFCCC itself, but it, it doesn't necessarily directly include subnational governments and private sector. So being able to uh, drive exponential action through this nested approach um, becomes very important. Everyone has a role to play. The chances of a, of a country meeting a nationally determined contribution is going to be more and more evident by the capacity of its non-state actors within its territory to actually properly set common pledges aligned with a nationally determined contribution and track them over time. So as we've seen in the last two years, um, a handful of private companies pledging net zero by 2040, the ability to have accountability of non-state actors will actually help the national level. And the national level has to be able to support the incentives for those non-state actors to come into action. Um, because in the case of, of the climate space, everything rolls up to the national inventory, which is what, what sovereigns present in, in tracking the Paris Agreement. So exponential action around democratization and the last point that I want to make is how do we ground all of this? Uh, digital trust, scaling collaboration, uh, democratization of action. And, and some of the most important things that we've been focusing on here is um, integration pilots, particularly between the private and the public space. So when I talked about digital trust before, the issue of identity is something that has always been in the public arena. I receive my passport or my ID. The issuance of, of governmentally valid IDs that have a role on the internet in the online space becomes very important. So government in the role of issuing self-sovereign identities in, in the digital space becomes important, but then also uh, the private sector interacting with that. Going into policy, if we start designing policy without necessarily thinking how that policy is going to be executed, from a technological standpoint, just think of thinking about policy around climate data disclosure of non-state actors. If the mechanism by which private sector discloses climate information to the public sector in a way that's easily auditable, ability to audit it fast and cheap and verify it, and then in even incorporate it into a national inventory becomes very important. So we've been, been discussing in the SDG space, the role of multi-stakeholder uh, models for quite some time, but in this space, uh, it becomes now more uh, important than, than than ever. At the Open Earth Foundation, for example, we've we've uh, been collaborating over the last couple of months with the government of British Columbia, who's uh, one of the different governments that has taken really big steps around the notion of self-sovereign identities, digital technology. As a government, they have an entire group dedicated to digital trust, and we've seen a lot of this coming out of Europe as well. Um, now, how, how do we as a nonprofit help collaborate between the private sector and the public sector and how that informs policy? This is a, a, an arena where the next uh, five years we should see a lot more action 
uh, happening. And also the supranationals, of course, um, uh, taking a role in that. And uh, both the four of those points that, that I mentioned, digital trust, scaling collaboration, exponential actions, and the role of these integration private public actors are relevant for perhaps some of the most important things we need to uh, have open science help us in the coming decades, which is Earth system governance. With that, I will open up to uh, questions and, uh, and join again the panel. Thank you so much, Marty, and thank you so much for all our uh, four speakers. And then we are moving to the Q&A session. We have 10 minutes to conclude. So every speaker, you have like two minutes to answer the question. So the first question will go to Fernanda. So from the perspective of social science, how can open science help to boost the interaction between science and society? And also for Latin America, we have a question from the audience that Latin America, is there a way to keep up to date uh, with the state of the research to make those research in English? Regarding the first part, it's interesting because in the social sciences, I think we, we can have a crit, I, I'm part of it, right? Um, we can have a critical role in creating and boosting what we could uh, call new interactions between science and, societal, uh, and the diverse societal actors because we have a long history in understanding, in creating these interactions and, and especially in understanding it. In particular, in Latin America, the social sciences and humanities have been very uh, deeply involved in third mission. Remember that I mentioned that this is a very long existing tradition with a, a very strong tradition and, and, and development in the universities and social sciences and humanities have a lot to, to say and to do in these interactions that are working in third mission. Regarding the English state of uh, arts in, in open access, this is difficult because we really have a very intensive production, uh, research uh, and uh, a public communication of, of open science and open access in Latin America, but indeed many, many of these are in Spanish. Anyways, I think that we are already having many inputs that are, are working in English and the recent UNESCO science report is very interesting in this way to, to keep up with the Latin American situation. I would like to mention that tomorrow we are going to listen in the in the panel tomorrow to Dominic Babini and Laura Rovelli. They have finished last year a regional report, which uh, I hope it's going to come very, very soon in English, and it's a regional Latin American report on open science by Claxo and Fundación Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. And I have one more question for both Carrie and for Martin. Uh, we know that there's so much fake science uh, for, for Carrie and Martin. Uh, we have a question from the audience that we know that there's a lot of like fake science uh, fake news in social media, and how can we rebuke trust between public and scientific community, especially the information is coming uh, about maybe some taking vaccine, about COVID-19 or climate change. How can we combat and rebu review the trust with the public? Carrie, go first and then Martin. Okay, it's a great question. It's a very hard question. Um, and I think it is another issue that illustrates our global connections, right? Because part of the issue is that because we are connected digitally, those misinformation can spread so fast, literally all over the world. And so that's part of what makes it hard to challenge, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I think at this point, that's why people are talking about what else can we do to stop it at the source to keep it from being spread so far? Because it's hard. Um, and so we, I don't think we have the solutions yet, but maybe Martin does. Thank you. Um, such an important, uh, again, to echo this uh, a point sort of now and going forward. I, I would probably talk about two main parts. One, uh, I, I sort of iterated on this as I was discussing the role that how do we recreate digital trust? Who is who in the internet, which is how we're receiving the information? How do we trace from a publication, the verification of the, the validity of a publication and, and science institutions down into uh, bite, uh, sizable bite chunks of information that the public receives? That tracing of, of trust uh, will become more and more important and how that, how a user or a consumer of information 
can be can be able to uh, know that a certain piece of information is verified. So there's a role of a digital infrastructure that needs to be in place uh, when a publication is presented. It's public. It's it's published in a in a journal in an online space. And so uh, same thing as as any information around scientific facts from scientific organizations. Those play a role on the internet, and they have an identity. So um, again, who is who? Who's a scientist? Uh, a verified, reputable scientist who's not, these things become very important. Um, and it's it's similar to the level of digital trust with online payments. So it's not that, that, that this is the first time we're dealing with a need for improved digital trust. The second part is, is probably a bit more complex, which is um, uh, more and more people have a very, very short bandwidth of the information that receive online because there's so much competition. And so the ability of sitting down and reading through scientific information actually goes down. People in many ways rather watch a, a, a two, uh, one minute video or, or a meme than actually read a, a journal. So the ability of, of more um, in, enhanced and um, is essentially how we communicate uh, science will become more and more important because the audience will receive it in a way that's different than how it received it before. How to uh, um, how to create more summaries for, for people, verified uh, information packages. Uh, um, I think that that will be another challenge on our ability for uh, just communication and, and new techniques for that. So ability to communicate better and again, the infrastructure for digital trust. Thank you, Martin. And we have one last question for Natalia. Uh, as you mentioned, the open data with a purpose rather than having a, dump, uh, a data dump is more effective. But like we know that citizens, they typically don't know about data sets and governments, they don't know like they have an opportunity to call create. So how can we solve that problem? That's a really good question and a complex question to, to answer. Uh, but a, an easy way for, for governments to understand which are uh, kind of uh, priorities for, for citizens uh, of like the types of data that they wanna, they wanna get at, it's also understanding which are the most requested uh, data pieces out of the freedom of information laws. So most, most countries now um, that have an open data policy also have uh, a law that enforces access, the, the right to access information. And so understanding which are the more, more requested types of data through the legal process of, of access to information is a good way, it's kind of a thermometer of, of uh, which data is being demanded. So that's just the first step, of course. Uh, whenever you, you are building up or, or implementing an open data policy, you need to create those participatory spaces. Uh, to understand which are the priorities for citizens. But, but that's a good thermometer. Uh, that's a good way to understand um, which types of, of data are, are being more, more requested. And that's sorry for the short answer, but I want to keep it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, and thanks, Fernanda. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks, Martin, Natalia, for joining today's panel and sharing with us your inspiring insights and findings about open science. And thank you all for participating in this panel. I will hand over to Astra for the next session. Thank you so much, Ying Chan, for moderating an excellent panel, and to Ms. Beagle, Ms. Funk, Ms. Carpey, and Mr. Weinstein for taking the time to join us today, and for your remarks, which really give us um, a lot to think about in our efforts to strengthen the bridge between access to science, trust in science, and the impact that open science can have on action. Um, I think this is really a, an interesting panel and um, many thanks as well for your patience with technology. I know it can be frustrating and Martin, you had the um, thoughtful comment that this is also part of, of where COVID has taken us to very much a, a digital world and a virtual platform that we're all um, patiently trying to navigate our way through. So, so thank you. <laughs>